For nearly three centuries, the Qing dynasty's imperial guards kept watch over the Forbidden City. They remained so enigmatic and emblematic that even after 70 years of communist rule in mainland China, they continue to be the subject of blockbuster movies. As with many guards' regiments, the Imperial Guards began as a formation consisting of the experienced elite of the various dynastic armies, although for the most part there is little doubt about the exceptional quality of their martial training, their actual experience in battle was quite limited. They did, however, know how to put on an exceptional parade and had great-looking equipment. Any aggressor would need to decide how much was for show and how much was real competence. In October 1950, the newly victorious communist government in Beijing was sent a gift by its benefactors in Moscow. The generous tribute was a new Soviet jet fighter, one so advanced that it had only entered service in 1948. By the end of the year, they would receive 372 of these aircraft, enough to equip six divisions. These were to be the Imperial Guards of the era, defenders of the great Chinese cities from their nationalist enemies. The aircraft was the MiG-9 Fargo, an enigmatic fighter and one that has acquired a tremendously poor reputation in the West. Some even call it the Parade Fighter, all show and no go. But was it really that bad? And, given that for a time it was China's main jet fighter, did it really play no role in the Korean War? In the late 1930s, engineers in Germany, Italy, Britain and the US started to independently develop jet engines. The experiments resulted in two production jet fighters that took an active part in the war, the Messerschmitt Me-262 and the Gloucester Meteor, and several others that played minor roles, and five mass-produced first-generation jet engines, the Junkers Jumo, BMW 003, Rolls-Royce Welland and Derwent, and the General Electric J33. The Soviet Union was slow to start the development of its own jet engines. Various purges of scientists, followed by a war of attrition that demanded vast numbers of solid, good enough weapons, meant that jet developing jets was an unnecessary luxury. Their first attempt began in 1944 and didn't result in a useful engine when it concluded after the war. Fortunately for the Soviets, they had succeeded in acquiring both a supply of BMW 003 engines and a complete set of blueprints enabling them to set up a production line in Leningrad to make more. To take advantage of this bounty, and potentially also narrow the growing gap between themselves and the West in jet aircraft design, two OKBs, Mikoyan Gurevich and Yakovlev, were directed to produce a jet interceptor using the 003. In 1939, Messrs Mikoyan and Gurevich were the beneficiaries when Nikolai Polikarpov fell out of favour with Stalin. His design for a high-altitude fighter was reassigned to the pair and became the MiG-1. Only 100 of these were manufactured and all were destroyed in the early days of Operation Barbarossa. Their follow-on MiG-3 entered production in late 1940. Over 3,000 were built, but the type was not particularly successful. It was a tricky beast to fly and fight, with essentially only one good point, its high speed at high altitude, and many bad ones. It was lightly armed, slow to climb, slow at low altitudes, and couldn't turn as well as contemporary fighters. It suffered the highest proportional losses of any Soviet fighter. The OKB received no further orders during the rest of the war, which wasn't a great sign of its future prospects. But then came another lucky break. They were both selected to develop a high-altitude jet interceptor, and they were apparently gifted some looted German plans to help them along the way. Although it looks positively odd today, the pod and boom configuration employed by the OKB for what would become the MiG-9 was actually quite a sensible arrangement. The configuration of mid-mounted straight wings, tricycle undercarriage, with the main gear retracting into the wings, tadpole configuration and 27 degree swept delta tailplane was essentially copied from a Fokker Wolf night fighter project. De Havilland's very successful vampire used something somewhat similar. 
Unlike the Vampire, though, the MiG-9 had its twin-engine intakes in the center of the fuselage, passing under the cockpit and exhausting at the rear. This led to a problem that would ultimately doom the design, where to place the armament. Common with other aircraft producers, Soviet fighter armament doctrine evolved between 1940 and 1945. Machine guns gave way to cannons early in the war, with mechanics actually stripping the wing guns off aircraft to save weight as the 7.62mm weapons added little weight of fire. Soviet pilots also preferred to have all of their guns on the centre line to make it easier to aim, even if it meant a lower overall weight of fire. Fighters from 1944 onwards carried either only 20mm cannons, like the LA-5 and LA-7, or a mix of cannons and 12.7mm machine guns like the Yak-7, the Yak-3, and early models of Yak-9. But sometime in the late war, Soviet planners decided that the 20mm was too light a weapon for a fighter. To this end, the Yak-9T, of which over 2,700 were built, carried a 37mm NS-37 cannon in the propeller hub, supplemented by two machine guns. The 9K took this even further, mounting a 45mm NS-45 cannon. This, it turned out, was more than the airframe could handle. Firing the cannon at low speeds led to a loss of control. The recoil caused oil and coolant leaks. Apparently unconcerned about the issues in firing an automatic anti-tank gun from a complex, relatively lightweight aircraft travelling at many hundreds of miles an hour, MiG decided to go for broke. The initial prototype therefore mounted a 57mm cannon on the centre line between the air intakes. Because this might not be enough firepower, they also fitted a pair of Noodleman Surinov NS-23 23mm cannons in a flush pod just below the fuselage. There were 80 rounds per gun for these, and just 28 rounds for the 57mm. Needless to say, the arrangement caused some issues. Beyond the frankly terrifying recoil, which made accurate shooting a matter of luck rather than judgement, the bigger issue was the large amount of propellant gas and debris ejected from the big gun's muzzle. This was, of course, immediately sucked into the engine, causing it to cut out. This was probably a bit of a head-scratcher for the designers, as it was frankly obvious that a bigger gun was a better gun. Try as they might, though, they couldn't get it right, and the MiG-9 went into production in the spring of 1947 armed with a 37mm NS-37 cannon and the 223mm. This combination would carry on in the MiG-15 and MiG-17. These issues were compounded by the poor reliability of the engine, which had a tendency to cut out if run at lower engine speeds above 20,000 feet. Even so, approval for production was given despite the first prototype breaking up and crashing in front of high-ranking observers, killing its pilot. Increased structural reinforcement was the upshot of the various issues that were identified. Under-engineering might seem like a surprising issue for a Soviet fighter. They're quite crude but very rugged, aren't they? Well, that might be the case now, but in the war, Soviet fighters were actually designed to be light and agile. For example, the Yak-1 family, of which tens of thousands were made from 1940 onwards, weighed only 6,300 pounds, versus 8,500 for the contemporary Curtis P-40 Warhawk and 7,000 pounds for the ME-109. The late war LA-9 weighed 7,500 pounds, against 9,200 for the P-51 Mustang. The MiG-9 continued this trend. It weighed just 10,700 pounds. A Mark III Meteor was 13,900, and a P-80 Shooting Star 12,200. A lot of this was down to smaller physical size, enabled in part by having simpler avionics. This schematic gives you an idea of how small the MiG was compared to its Western contemporaries. MiG-9s began to reach operational squadrons in 1948, equipping about 18 fighter regiments around Moscow, Leningrad, Kaliningrad and in East Germany. 
The MiG-9's role was to act as a high-speed, high-altitude bomber interceptor in the event of an all-out attack by US B-29s. Performance-wise, the aircraft was more or less suitable for the role. If we assume that P-51s or possibly F-82 twin Mustangs would be assigned to escort such formations, as they had done successfully for B-17s in Europe, then the MiG-9 had enough performance to get through the escorts and attack the bombers. At full throttle, it was 130 miles an hour faster than a Mustang, climbed 25% faster and had a slightly higher service ceiling. Full throttle also had the advantage of avoiding the low engine speeds that the copied BMW motor didn't like. The issue for MiG-9 regiments attacking these bomber formations was twofold. First, their aircraft were relatively fragile. A lot of systems were packed into a small space, and there was only a little armour. A B-29 formation would put out a wall of 50 caliber bullets. Even at high speed, some hits were likely to be received and the MiG-9 seems incapable of taking them. But the bigger issue was the cannons. Fitting a 37mm in place of the 57 made little difference to the stalling issue. The engineers tried all manner of solutions, including moving the guns into a different position and fitting a device they called a butterfly on the muzzle to root gases away. The butterfly worked well until the vibrations caused it to disintegrate. The pieces would then be sucked into the engines, destroying them. But at least it didn't stall. Because of this issue, there was no realistic way that the 37mm could be used in attacking a bomber if the pilot wanted to survive the encounter. That left the MiG-9's impressively heavy weight of fire reduced to 223mm. Still heavier than a P-80, but that is not a high bar. That is the main story with the MiG-9. It was not a bad plane by early jet standards. It was easy to fly and relatively reliable as long as you ran the engine fast enough. If it had arrived in 1944, then it would have been a remarkable achievement. By the time it entered service, though, its successor, the vastly more capable MiG-15, was just a year away. Numerous improvements were trialled on the MiG-9, including quite sophisticated things like afterburners and a pressurised cockpit, and things you would normally consider to be essential, like an ejection seat. None of them were followed through because the platform was obsolete on delivery. The Fargo would have only been a useful asset in a narrow capacity, intercepting strategic bombers in the presence of only piston-engined escort fighters. Their pilots had an early opportunity to try out this mission during the 1948 Berlin airlift. A pilot flying RAF Halifaxes converted into cargo aircraft wrote about a near miss he had with the type. He recounted, We were buzzed by a Russian MiG-9 at about 4 o'clock in the morning. It was just getting daylight. There was this great shudder and this fighter aircraft flew underneath us and looped around us. As he came down, I had no room to manoeuvre. I suppose he missed us by about two to three hundred feet. It was enough to make the aircraft shudder. Things like that I remember because I was frightened. I mean, you would remember that. Scaring transport aircraft is one thing, but the fact is that if in doing so the Fargo came up against any US or RAF jet fighter, it was outclassed in every aspect of performance. Even the modest vampire would have easily overpowered it, although at least the MiG could have potentially outrun it. They were, however, pretty useful to the People's Republic of China. Their enemies in the Republic had only B-17s with which to attack the mainland from Formosa. These slow aircraft flying at 20,000 feet or so were very vulnerable to a MiG-9, which could dive through their formations at great speed. They were actually a decent deterrent. Of course, defending themselves from the Republican forces was only part of the Chinese Communist Party's strategic problem in the early 1950s. On June the 25th, 1950, North Korean forces had invaded the South and rapidly began to push the disorganized South Korean army back. The US intervened under a UN banner and, although initially in retreat on the ground, their air power slowed the North Korean advance and then helped to stop it altogether in September. North Korea ended up firmly on the defensive and China was forced to intervene on their side in October 1950. But this isn't a video about the Korean War, 
as fascinating as that would have been. Suffice to say that the Soviet Union really wanted the Chinese to send their MiG-9s to Korea to challenge the UN forces' air superiority. The historical records suggest that this didn't happen. There are, however, persistent rumours that are worth covering. I found a tantalising post on a forum stating that, according to American data, during the Korean War, the Chinese lost at least one MiG-9 fighter. Kenneth D. Chandler, an F-86A pilot from the 336th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, announced the destruction of such an aircraft in a dogfight on November 18, 1951. China does not confirm this loss. Now, of course, China doesn't confirm any losses, and I obviously wanted to figure this one out, so I did some digging. Captain Kenneth D. Chandler was indeed flying in Korea at the time. The official record does state that he scored a kill in the closing months of 1951, but the record also says that it was on the 13th of December and his victim was a MiG-15. There's actually quite a bit of information about this incident, as Kenneth Chandler became a bit of a celebrity after the war. After he shot down the MiG, his sabre ingested pieces of its debris that in turn caused him to eject over Chodo Bay. This was observed by a Korean interpreter at the Chodo rescue station named Ted Kim, who rode out with a Korean airman to wait for Chandler to drift down on his parachute. They then pulled him out of the water and waited in the boat until a helicopter arrived. After the war, Kenneth Chandler continued his career in the Air Force. He won the Bendix Trophy on the 29th of June 1957, piloting an F-102 Delta Dagger. Sadly, he died on March 28, 1958, when his T-33 crashed on an evening training flight while attempting a ground control landing at Lowry Air Base in Colorado. He was just 33. I also looked for kills around the 18th of November. There is one claim on that day. Two F-84 Thunderjet pilots claimed a MiG-15. First Lieutenants John Hewitt Jr. and Kenneth Cooley, both from the 111th Fighter Bomber Squadron, were awarded half a kill each. This was verified in the post-war assessment on the US side. For completeness, I checked the Russian side of the story, which is well chronicled in Red Devils Over the Yalu. Cooley and Hewitt's kill is recorded, and there, on the next page, is reference to a different Chandler incident, which also occurred on the 18th. Coming back from a sortie in MiG Alley, Chandler's flight spotted a dozen Chinese MiG-15s lined up in the open at a new base at Weiju. Diving down on them, Chandler was credited with destroying four and damaging four more. This was clearly seen as the big event of the day, as it caused the remnants of that fighter division to withdraw back north of the Yalu. Perhaps that's why the next sentence is casually delivered. On this same mission, Captain Chandler, while patrolling over the Yalu, had downed an enemy aircraft, which he identified as a MiG-9. Could this have been the case? And thus, did MiG-9s actually participate in the Korean War in some way? Well, the first thing to think about is whether Captain Chandler is a credible source. Did a dogfight happen at all? Well, I think we can say yes to both with some certainty. First, Chandler was clearly an excellent aviator. He flew P-47s in the Second World War, flew on Chuck Yeager's wing in the making of the film Fighter Pilot, and then went to Korea. He was leading a flight of four Sabres at the time, and given their later heroics on that mission, it seems unlikely that they would have agreed to make up a story. The next thing I wondered about was whether MiG-9s were deployed anywhere near MiG Alley in November 1951. And again, the answer is yes. The 6th Fighter Aviation Regiment was based between Andong, Miaogu, Dapu and Dagashan on the Chinese border and had around 56 MiG-9s serviceable at any one point. In November 1951, the main Chinese contribution to the air war was a series of bitter complaints to Stalin about the quality of the weapons they were being supplied. The small Soviet contingent flying MiG-15s were having significant success against the UN forces. The Chinese flyers weren't in the fight because of their reluctance to send their MiG-9s into battle. The situation caused some angst. The Chinese saw the MiG-9 as a useful trainer for jet pilots and maintainers, 
They had 900 Soviet technicians and a variety of other aircraft, including Yak-17 jets, supplied for that purpose. The Soviets, Stalin included, had thought that the MiG-9 would be comparable to straight-wing jet fighters like the Shooting Star, Thunder Jet and Meteor. Hindsight shows that they were wrong. The performance of those Western fighters was likely only vaguely known to the Soviets. Presumably, they based their assessment on captured ME-262s. In the main, these had lower performance than the on-paper specification of the MiG-9. Stalin explicitly demanded that the Chinese deploy their MiG-9s to Korea as a stipulation for supplying more MiG-15s. In a private communique, he said that China could take to the front from central and southern China five or six MiG-9 divisions, which would operate effectively against bombers. As a direct result of this, there were MiG-9s deployed on the Chinese side of the Yalu River on November 18, 1951. Interviews with Soviet pilots suggest, but don't state, that MiG-15s typically were used to fight the Sabres, while piston-engined LA-11 fighters and the MiG-9s went after fighter bombers. The extent to which this actually happened is debatable, but it was the doctrine in 1951 when MiG-15s were relatively rare outside of the Soviet forces. So there were MiG-9s in the area. Chandler likely shot at something. We can be relatively sure that it wasn't a piston-engined aircraft or a MiG-15, because the first would have been obvious, and he would probably have preferred to shoot down a MiG-15 over a Fargo. My next question, therefore, was why the USAF didn't acknowledge the kill. This one I think is easier. Gun cameras don't always work. In fact, they quite regularly didn't work in Korea. Without any footage, you wouldn't even get a probable. So it could have happened, but there's no evidence it did beyond Chandler's testimony and the hearsay from the Russian side about something that happened to a Chinese flyer. Just to muddy the waters, I also wonder why the MiG-9 was out there on its own. That doesn't seem to fit with Chinese or Soviet doctrine, which was for formations of two or three aircraft. I therefore have an inkling of a thought that the victim might actually have been a Yak-17. Why do I think this? Well, as the trainer aircraft attached to squadrons, it seems more likely that one of those might have been tooling around in Chinese airspace and either strayed onto the wrong side or been attacked north of the Yalu by a sabre. That, incidentally, might also explain why the USAF didn't allow Chandler's claim. Going across the Yalu was forbidden by the rules of engagement, and airmen could be disciplined for doing so. You certainly couldn't, or rather wouldn't, push a claim for a kill you'd made on the wrong side of the river. I'm afraid I can't offer much more than this. For what it's worth, my theory is that Chandler and his formation went north of the Yalu and shot down either a MiG-9 or a Yak-17. I can't prove it, so take my logic as you see fit. Even though its service in the Korean War was minor at best, the MiG-9 had another useful role to play. It was a relatively simple introduction to flying jet fighters. Going straight to the outstanding but treacherous MiG-15 with its high power and unforgiving handling would have been too much for Chinese aviators. Going via the Fargo likely reduced the accident rate. Training and retraining pilots was an issue for many countries in the post-war era. Losing them in crashes was a tragedy from a human and a strategic perspective. To that end, the Russian package of support in 1950 had included those military specialists and enough equipment to establish six flight schools. It laid the groundwork for the jet air force that would take on the UN in Korea, support and train the VPAF in Vietnam, and in general continues to irritate the US to this day. By 1956, all of China's MiG-9s had been replaced by MiG-15s. None of the former survive in flying condition and there are no examples in the West, so we have little information about how they performed in the real world. The MiG-9 was in production for barely a year. The vastly superior MiG-15 was so close behind it that there was no point in continuing its development. It is because of that aircraft's massive success and the fame of its successors that we recognise the MiG-9 at all. It was, after all, the least successful of the straight-winged Soviet jets. The Yak-15 and 17 served as trainers into the 1960s. The Yak-23 was a frontline fighter well into the 50s in the Warsaw Pact. I'm not saying that they were any good either, but they did endure.